Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Food Lovers Elective. Um, we're really excited to have you guys here with us today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, the Food Lovers Elective, a craft conversation series. Um, and at Craft, we seek to foster a transformative regional food system in Western Pennsylvania that recognizes the central role of food systems in our society and the values of the people who live and work within them. We envision a food system that is equitable, fostering fairness and transparency across the value chain. A system that is sustainable, actualizing economic, social and cultural well-being as part of the food system. And a food system that is inclusive, valuing dignity, sovereignty and the inherent power of all people. We're really excited to show you guys um, today's episode. Um, today's pre-recorded episode is titled Voices of the Diaspora, How a New Generation is Shaping the Narratives Around Asian Food and Culture. Due to Ms. Wei's time difference, um, as she is in Taipei at this time, this episode was recorded, but Katie will join at the end to answer any other questions. This episode will take about an hour with 10 to 15 minutes reserved for question and answer at the end. Um, please feel free to engage with our moderator um, and with us through the chat. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A section um, that is also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, now I will um, bring up Katie's video and we hope that you guys enjoy. Thanks. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Katie Ruther and I'm a first year master's student in food studies at Chatham University. As a Chinese American, my own experiences with food and agriculture, living in the US and China, led me to my interest in the topics that we'll be exploring today. I am very excited to be speaking today with Clarissa Wei, who's an American freelance journalist based in Taipei. Clarissa's writing has been published on numerous platforms, including the New York Times, the LA Times, Vice, NPR, CNN, Bon Appetit, Sauveur, and many others. She was previously a senior reporter at Gold Thread, a video-centric imprint of the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, where she made over 100 videos on the food and culture of the greater China area. She's the host and producer of Climate Cuisine, a podcast of the Whetstone Radio Collective, and she's currently working on her first cookbook, Made in Taiwan. Clarissa and I actually crossed paths. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I guess just in the interest of time here, we will jump in. There are a couple of different areas I wanna focus on today. So namely the experiences that you've had and the perspectives that you've developed on Chinese food in America compared to those in China and the greater China area and how your identity has shaped and been shaped by the work that you do. Okay. Um, so yeah, starting with Chinese food in America, I sort of just got into that as a point of familiarity um, as Taiwanese American and Chinese eating. Um, Chinese food, um, it was just something that I felt as a journalist, I can sort of gravitate towards and have a little bit more leeway in terms of being able to interview people in Chinese. Um, and also food is just an easier topic to get into, I think, when I was starting off in journalism. Um, so I really just did it as a way to get bylines in the beginning. Um, and it was really interesting because I lived in LA, which I think like um, of like 80% of all the provinces in China are represented um, in a restaurant in LA. So from that, I was really able to experience what regional Chinese food was, um, but at a very like baseline level. And when I went to China um, and travels around to the provinces and actually ate the food, it was really interesting to compare and contrast, you know, the difference between food in China versus food in Chinese food in the States. And like the key takeaway from it was that, um, as you know, food in China is really much based, regional food in China is very much based on seasonality and geography. And so in America, we have this perception that Chinese food isn't fresh, it's like greasy, 
um, deep fried, um, and but that's not true at all in China. They use you know the freshest ingredients. There's wet markets everywhere, um, and it really is rooted in regionality and seasonality, and we don't get that in the U.S. at all. So that was just a really fascinating, um, yeah, contrast I was able to see. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so going back in time, I'm interested to dive a little bit deeper into your experiences in LA growing up and what role food played in your life at that time. Yeah, again, I never really started focusing on food as a topic um, of writing until college. So I didn't really think about food that way at all or if yeah, at all <laughs> growing up in LA. Obviously I was raised by Taiwanese parents. So we grew up eating a lot of Taiwanese food. Um, there was a lot of Chinese diaspora where I live. So we also had, you know, quite a bit of regional Chinese food, but it wasn't something I thought about deeply. Um, and, but then going back to my childhood home after college and after life experiences, I began, began to realize like how valuable those food experiences were because like most people don't grow up in America and like learn all about Chinese food, but like my specific experience in LA helped me learn about <laughs> Chinese food. Yeah, wow, that's really interesting. Um, and I, I know that you went to school in New York City and I'm wondering how being in New York continued to sort of shape your relationship with Chinese food or your conception of Chinese food in the US or abroad. Um, what was interesting about the Chinese food scene in New York is it's also very, it's very different from LA. LA has a lot of more recent immigrants, whereas New York, the immigration is mostly a lot of people from Fujian and a lot of Cantonese food, but I would say there's more regional diversity um, in LA. And because I'm biased, I think LA Chinese food is better. So going to New York and like trying some of the Chinese restaurants, I was like, oh, this is not what I'm used to at all. Um, I was just used to a very certain type of quality or, you know, um, a lot of the restaurant, Chinese restaurants that I went to weren't like cheap takeout places. I rarely ever went to those places. There were like dim sum banquet restaurants or like eateries that just specialized in dumplings, whereas New York was just a lot of takeout places, fast, casual um, and then I, if anything, it just made me realize, you know, how much more there is to discover on the topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have the food piece there. Uh, what led you to journalism? Yeah. Um, I think I started during the 2008 election elections, presidential elections, when Obama was first running for office. And I just was glued to CNN. And I had this found, and I was like 17 to 16 years, no, 17 years old. Um, and I just had this profound feeling that if I want to do something about anything, you know, media is the way to go. Like, look at me, I'm just sitting here in front of the TV, listening to everything that they're saying. And I saw that as a distinct sphere of influence to be able to make a difference. Um, but I also realized at that very young age that as a woman of color, it would be so much more difficult for me to get anywhere close to that. Um, but then I knew that, you know, I decided this at 17, so I have time on my side. Um, but yeah, it was just really seeing how powerful the media um, was at that age and during that um, historical uh, turning point as well. Mm -hmm. So how did you begin to develop your career in journalism and then eventually move toward Chinese food? Yeah, um, so I majored in journalism um, and politics at NYU um, and I was part of the student newspaper. I think I did like 12 internships, it was insane. Um, and then I really just started freelancing a lot, mostly for food blogs. And again, it was just like the one niche I could get ahead of um, everyone else. You know, everyone else was doing political reporting. And I just didn't, it was it's so competitive, right? So my strategy is always to just find something that I'm interested in. Um, 
and uh, don't necessarily try to compete with everyone else and it just sort of stuck um, and then when I moved back to LA I started covering Chinese restaurants in LA and what was really cool was like I speak Chinese so I was able to actually interview a lot of these restaurant owners which is something believe it or not not a lot of people do <laughs> but because of the cultural and language barriers um, and yeah that's just the very beginning of it and I just feel like I've been doing this for a decade now and I feel like as someone who's multilingual and like of different cultures the advantage is that I can talk to a completely different culture and bring that perspective um, back to the English speaking world. Mm -hmm. At that point early on in your career did you have anyone to look up to in the field who was doing something similar or who was supporting you? Um, I don't think so. I don't, yeah, I really don't have one of those like pivotal people I worshiped. I mean, again, I mentioned like the CNN anchors, but it wasn't anyone in particular. It was just seeing journalists working <laughs> on TV where that inspired me, but not someone in particular. When you first started reporting on Chinese food in the US, how were you seeing it portrayed? Yeah, I think it was just very one-sided or just very limited. There's a lot of coverage on Sichuan restaurants, obviously, and some Shanghainese restaurants, but people didn't really get into the nuances of regionality. Um, and I only think recently have people started to realize that there's much more to Chinese food than Sichuan food or like the takeout genre and not every Chinese menu is the same. And we're finally starting to move away from that stereotype that um, Chinese food is heavy with MSG and is greasy. And uh, it's really cool to see how the conversation has evolved. Um, and that's in part because there are restaurants and young chefs now um, who are opening these new concepts and um, really bringing their modern spin to it um, without losing the original flavor. Mm -hmm. So what were you focusing on in your early work when you were interviewing, you said restaurant owners and others who are working in this space, what kinds of things were you trying to um, present to the Western audiences that you were writing for? Um, Sorry, could you repeat that? Sure, okay. yes. Yeah, of course. So at that point in your career, sort of early on, when you were uh, interviewing restaurant owners and others who were working in the field, um, what were you focusing your stories on and what were you kind of trying to convey in the reporting that you were doing? Um, mostly just the humanity of people and if they had any quirky, interesting stories. It wasn't necessarily even restaurant owners. Like I would scour the Chinese food forums. Um, there were a couple back in the day. I don't think they're very active now. I found this guy who just like responded to every question and the questions were really random. Like um, what was the first Chinese restaurant that opened in San Francisco or um, which restaurant in America has like cashew chicken and there was this one guy who kept on responding and I decided to reach out to him and see if he wanted to meet and it turned out to be um, a tax lawyer, um, Chinese American, he can't use chopsticks and he's eaten at more than like 6,000 Chinese restaurants and has it all, all on a spreadsheet and no one had ever written about him. So I think I just sort of go with what fascinates me um, and go from there. I don't have a specific agenda or um, angle that I, preconceived angle that I take for every story. It's just whatever pops out to me and something that I want to tell my friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were there any big takeaways from those early years doing that type of reporting that you informed either what you did later or that you um, took away wanting to know more about? Yeah, I mean, I'm really glad I, so one of my first jobs was to do like five blog posts a day. And I'm really glad that I learned how to be fast and like be a good reporter because now I think because of online media, there are so many websites and blogs and sub stacks 
Um, there are a lot of great writers out there, um, but not a lot of people do reporting and food writing isn't necessarily food journalism. Um, but I always try to bring that reporting aspect into everything um, that I write, because I think as someone who I tend to cover Asian food, um, these voices, the people who are making the food, they're often unheard. You know, you don't hear their voices in the stories. You just get this glowing picture of their food, but you don't find the humanity behind it. Um, so that's the main takeaway that I've learned and it's a philosophy that I still abide by. When you were writing those types of stories, where were you able to get them published? How are you like making connections to get publications or were people ever approaching you for certain stories that they wanted you to report on? Yeah, so for me, uh, living in New York obviously was really helpful, um, but then after that I sort of just traveled around, you and I met in China, and I think a lot of it was just being active on Twitter and being friends, Twitter friends with a lot of other journalists, and you start to see the same people pop up, um, and then you all sort of know each other, it's a small world, so um, I would cold pitch obviously, I did that a lot in the beginning, and I still do that. Um, and then, but then after a while you develop relationships with editors that you like, and um, that's kind of how I chose which publication I wanted to write for. It's really just how easy it is to work with the editor, because as a freelancer, it can be really hard to do your job, which is reporting and writing, but also like cold pitching or like trying to hunt down someone to take your pitch. Um, so I always just prioritize the relationships um, that were really good to me. That's great. Um, so now I wanna move more to your time in Asia. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you made the jump to working and living in Asia initially. Um, it, I wasn't a conscious decision. I was just traveling here um, as I did per usual. Um, I was only going to be in Taiwan for a couple of months. And then I got the job offer um, at the South China Morning Post. And the person who offered me the job was an editor that I had freelanced for just a couple of times. So I didn't really know her. Um, but they were starting this new video vertical that was focused on food. And they wanted me to be one of the first reporters. And I like, I think I'm, I, the last full-time job I had before that was like five years before that time. And I never really liked full-time jobs. I find them really binding and suffocating, but this just seemed like an opportunity that was too good to pass up because my job would be to literally travel to China once a month, all expenses paid and like shoot videos. And I got a team and everyone at that time was in their 20s or early 30s and it just seemed like a dream come true so i took that job and i've been in asia ever since then i got married and my husband and i moved to taiwan so here we are but it was never a conscious decision that oh i want to stay in asia mm -hmm. when you first came to asia and you got the job and you started working were there any particular things that like really shocked you or like what was the transition like for you there wasn't as big of a transition because like when we met i was traveling through china by myself already for six months and that was before i moved here full time so i had spent a lot of time in asia by myself and i'm really glad i had that experience to travel around um during the time when you and i met um or was it that you could have met when I was at Gold Thread? Anyways, but before I was just backpacking through China by myself and I just did a couple of freelance articles here and there and just being on the ground and talking to people without a real schedule to follow and without people like hounding me to finish deadlines was, that was kind of my easing into the Asia lifestyle um, trip and, living in Hong Kong in a big city was a piece of cake compared to that. So it wasn't as much of a culture shock at all. Hmm. Hmm. 
how were you received by people when you were backpacking and kind of doing freelance stories and just traveling? Yeah, I mean, back then it was pretty common. And it's I mean, now with COVID and so much anti-China US tensions, it's difficult. But like, I just was another one of the many travelers, um, both there were a lot of international travelers or Chinese travelers. And I was in my like early, I was in my mid twenties. So I just stayed at hostels. So I didn't stand out <laughs> if that's what you meant. I just blended in and that was really cool because then people were just really down to talk to me. Um, and I wasn't doing anything hard hitting. It was just trying to figure out the origins of a dish or trying to learn about that region's flavor profiles. Um, so yeah, it was such a great experience. And it's like kind of sad that who knows when's the next time I'll be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So to go back to your time at Gold Thread, can you tell me a little bit more about the sort of mission of the uh, platform and what the content looked like? Yeah. Um, so again, I'm not with them anymore, so I don't know if they have shifted or, but when we started, it's very much true now. It's just to highlight the, the food and culture um, of the greater China area. Um, they focus obviously more on mainland China. Um, and my beat obviously is food. So I just kind of got to go as nerdy as I wanted, like figuring out the science behind sundry eggs and just getting deeper into Chinese food because our advantage was that we had access and we could be on the ground and we had the funding to be able to do that. And it was such a great experience that I am so thankful for um, to be able to, you know, have a random question and then being flown to China the next day to figure out <laughs> the answer. Yeah. What were some of the biggest challenges of bringing the gold thread content to Western audiences? I think with anything that I write, not just gold thread, it's like how to make it relevant. Um, and I think we found a niche after a while. It was just people who had a familiarity with Chinese food, but wanted to know, wanted to know more, but it was hard for us to just reach the average person. Um, so that was always just a difficulty, like how deep can we go without boring people? And that's true of a lot of video journalism because you want to capture people's imaginations. You want to tell a story, um, but you don't want to bore people. So we were always sort of experimenting with what's the best format to tell this story, or is this worth even a video story? Should we just write an article about it? And um, I think that's the challenge of multimedia content these days. Yeah, yeah. What was it like for you to go from primarily writing to doing more video work? So I, when I was in college, I was a broadcast major uh broadcast like i was specialized in broadcast um but i also knew that i needed to have all the skills so i knew how to shoot and i kind of know how to edit like i have the basic skills i just don't like doing it so it wasn't as hard of a transition um because i had a background um with broadcast journalism um but again it was like sort of writing the scripts you have to change the voice a little bit compared to an article and it's not that hard. Um, I think writing for video is a bit easier than writing an article because video, you just have to let the visuals tell the story. Um, but it wasn't a hard transition at all. And I think that's kind of the benefit of growing up as a millennial, having access to all these different types of multimedia. And again, at a very young age, I was very aware that you can't just be a print journalist, even if you are, you really need to have these other skills to be able to tell a story using all the different mediums. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Gold Thread story or uh, reporting experience from your time there? Um, yeah, I mean, we had a lot of, we interviewed Din Shi Xiaoge, who's like, a, this was one of my last trips with them. And this was before COVID hit. 
it was um, Dianxi Xiaoge, and she's one of the top like life lifestyle YouTubers or um, video vloggers in China. And she basically lives this idyllic countryside life where she, you know, makes, grows her own food and makes everything from scratch. And me and the team got to go and live with her for a week. And it was just really cool. Like she really does do everything from scratch and just hanging out with um, her and seeing how she, how hard she works to filming her content um, and how talented she is as well. Um, that was just such a trait. Um, but there were a bunch of like once <laughs> my boss and my uh, video producer, we just got paid to go to the Qingdao Beer Festival. And that's all we did. We just drank and like hung out. And that was a work trip. So a lot of random trips like that. And sadly, because of COVID, that has all stopped. But um, yeah, I'm really glad I have all of those videos to look back on and be like, that's that's what I did when I was in Hong Kong. Mm, yeah, wow. Uh, when you were working on stories like that, what was the process of like doing the research and and like locating people, contacting people for stories and how did they respond to your interest, I guess, in them and what they were doing? Yeah, generally people are pretty down to talk to us because again, we're really just trying to we don't do negative or yeah, negative news coverage or anything political. We just really want to highlight cool people doing cool things. So people are generally just very happy. Sometimes the bigger companies, if it's like a um, a factory that's just too many bureaucratic loopholes to go through but if it's just an artisan or a chef which is again like those are the stories i prefer anyways um, most people were really down and we just sort of cold um well in the beginning i just reached out to all the my friends i met while i was backpacking through china um because i met so many people from all over and then after we had exhausted my network then it was a lot of cold emails and you know doing some actual research but i just started with what i knew yeah wow um i have watched many gold thread videos and really have enjoyed um all of the content such a wide variety so highly highly recommend um so thinking more broadly about the work on food and culture that you do in China and the greater China area, I'm curious what some of the main messages are or the goals um, that you're trying to communicate through your reporting and if they're similar or different from the writing that you've done on Chinese food in America. Um, I don't know if there is like a specific goal that weaves through all of my work um but the resounding lesson i've learned from all of that is just the concept of regionality um and how you can't just assume chinese food is this monolith and you can describe it in one broad stroke and the food it's not just like the food culture it's like the language um the way people talk uh, how they act it really differs and china is such a huge place um and really making that distinction i think has been really important to me and i love like figuring out these nuances as well so just figuring out just realizing that chinese food is very very diverse i think has just been the common theme in my reporting Mm -hmm. Would you say that your representations of Chinese culture and cuisine um, differ from existing work on the topics, or do you think it aligns with things or that things that are out there already? I don't think there's been a extremely deep exploration of regional Chinese cuisine. Obviously, there has been a couple of great books and cookbooks and cookbook authors. Um, but there's not as much as say Italian food or even Mexican food. Um, but again, I think it's a matter of time, you know, um, I think after the stop Asian hate movement, like I've been seeing just a lot more cookbooks come out by people 
of Asian descent or Chinese people, um, just a lot of Asian cookbooks coming out and it's really exciting. And I think, you know, the world is starting to realize that there's just so much more. Um, so I'm really optimistic um, for the future of that. And as for me, I'm lately, I've just been focusing on actually setting Taiwanese food apart from Chinese food. Um, again, that plays into the, the theme of diversity and regionality and really figuring out what makes the food culture um, of a place unique. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that a little bit more uh, when hopefully we have time to chat about your cookbook. Um, so since you started your career, have you seen the narrative around Chinese food and culture change in the West? I know you referenced just um, a minute ago how there's a lot more content coming out from Asian um, writers and, and cookbook writers, things like that. But um, I'm curious if you've seen like some general themes throughout the last 10 years or so, any changes? Yeah, I think just within the last couple of years, I've just seen been seeing a lot of publications hiring people of actual Asian descent and people are writing about what's familiar to them, what they grew up with. Um, it's not always this like strive for um, authenticity, which is a word I hate, um, but it's just, these are the flavor profiles I grew up with my family. Um, some people and like everyone comes from such different places and then they bring those flavor profiles into the recipe development and into the dishes. And that really has only happened in the last five years. So now you can like log on to any of the big food magazines or newspapers. And if you search Asian food, like the more recent um, archives will have Asian bylines which is really cool like that did not exist when i first started out i feel like 10 years ago so i do think the tide is changing and that's in part because people are really vocal about it they want representation hmm. are there any particular changes that you would like to see take place in the future in this space i mean i think we're already getting there the fact that again if you like go on any website or um magazine that specializes in food you you see people um doing these more authentic recipes um i would love to just see like one thing that you don't really see is like a television post <laughs> showing people especially a female television host it's usually men um showing people around asia because it's that genre has traditionally just been dominated by you know very charismatic men um but they always approach it from an outsider's perspective so it'd be really cool um to get you know an insider who speaks the language preferably a female to um do that yeah very cool um, so you have touched on this uh, a little bit throughout our time talking, but can you talk a little bit more about your experiences working in journalism as a Taiwanese American woman? Yeah, uh, the identity issue didn't really play a part until I moved to Taiwan. I never, I was just another writer, writing Asian writer, writing about Asian food in America. But coming to Taiwan, I've had a lot of outlets reach out to me and they want to do stories about Taiwanese identity and people just really trying to understand how Taiwan plays, how Taiwanese people feel in the midst of all of this um, geopolitical tensions. And um, again, like because I grew up in the States, I don't think my experience is as representative as people who actually were born and raised here in Taiwan, but um, it's really interesting <laughs> being here during a time in history where there's so much interest in Taiwan. And I think having, being the background that I am from does give me a certain advantage um, because people want that human angle. Mm -hmm. And personally, what has it been like sort of navigating your Taiwanese I American identity and the work that you're doing and now living in Taiwan? 
Um, it's this, it's really interesting because, you know, the stereotype as an Asian American in America is that you don't feel like you fit in to the greater American fabric. Um, and I feel like that even more here in Taiwan, because like while my Chinese, I can, I'm conversationally fluent, I'm not like technically fluent. Um, so there's a lot of just language barriers and like even really minute cultural barriers that I didn't even think was going to be an issue because I was raised by Taiwanese parents. Um, but it is different when you spend your whole life abroad and yeah, there definitely has been a bit of a culture shock. Um, but it's, yeah, it's weird being an immigrant in the country where your family is from. It's definitely like a really surreal experience, but it has made me appreciate how multicultural, you know, America is and my childhood there. And I think, you know, wherever you are, the grass is always greener. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How accessible have you found topics surrounding Chinese or Taiwanese food and culture, um, like in America versus when you're actually in Asia? Accessible, you mean? Like, how yeah, is yeah, in terms of like culturally and like linguistically accessible. Um, so. I don't, so I don't consume chi like domestic media, if you will. So I don't actually have a good gauge um, on that, but I would say that in terms of like the food scene, most people here are fixated on, like most Taiwanese people are fixated on like the up and coming restaurants, which tend to have like a bit of a Western or international flair to it, whereas um americans or foreigners in taiwan tend to focus on like the traditional old school street food um type of coverage so it's really interesting to see the difference between how different groups of people perceive asian food in asia um and yeah i mean in terms of accessibility i think yeah, I probably would not be the person who would know that answer. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. And I'm curious, just like for you personally, um, you know, having grown up in the U.S., uh, how like reporting in Asia felt for you, like going into these spaces as an American who presents as uh, Chinese, Taiwanese, Asian um, to people who are local and like what those uh, experiences or like dynamics are like. Yeah, I mean, so in America, if you hold a microphone up to the average American, they'll have sound bites for you, right? Like it's nothing. But in Taiwan, like people get really freaked out and there's a lot of like bureaucratic loopholes and this like, it just feels like I'm dealing with my mom all the time. Like people are like, can I have the questions ahead of time, which you're not supposed to do as a journalist, or can I read the article before it's published? So just a lot of these like, like absolutely nots <laughs> that happen here a lot in Taiwan. And it's a bit concerning because it is a free society with a free press, but culturally it's like very conservative um, in some aspects. So it is harder interviewing normal people. And sometimes if you just want to get a random thought of a person off the street, like they literally won't have anything to say. Um, what, that's not true in America. In America, it's just so easy to get people to express themselves and to tell you how they feel. Hmm, that's really interesting. Do you think people are more or less willing to talk to you because of your identity? No, um, I don't think so. It really just depends on the outlet and what, how it's going to be distributed and if it fits with their, you know, agenda or if it benefits them. So I don't think my identity plays an issue. Um, I think if anything, because I kind of sound more similar to them, they feel a bit more comfortable with me. Um, but I think that's really the only advantage. Hmm. And then lastly, um, related to identity, do you feel limited by your identity in any way in the work that you're doing? Or I don't know, how do you see that? Um, not really. Like I 
chose, not like I was forced to cover Asian food or Taiwanese food. I've just chosen it um, because, again, I think it's a way to distinguish myself from the, the rat pack. Um, but at the core of all the work that I do, I'm really interested in, you know, regionality. And that doesn't just extend to Chinese food um, and Asian food. But because I am here, I just focus on that. So again, like my philosophy with my career has always to just find things I'm really interested in um, and then just go <laughs> with that. So um, everything else that follows is just a result of my interest. Mm, that's great. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, we just have a couple more minutes here to talk um, sure. about uh questions that i have and then we'll go to audience questions so maybe to end we'll talk about your cookbook a little bit and go back to uh what you were saying before about wanting to differentiate between mainland chinese and taiwanese cuisine and um, what your motivations were for creating the cookbook yeah um so Taiwanese food has always been lumped into the general umbrella of Chinese food, and I just feel like it does the cuisine such a disservice. And that's also even true here in Taiwan because we have such a deep history of colonization. Um, like my great grandparents were born underneath the Japanese Empire, and my grandmother was, um, you know, when the KMT came, just lots like a huge dictator. And then my parents were born during martial law or like they lived through martial law, sorry. And so with all of that, all of these upheavals, history just keeps on getting erased and changed. And I really wanted to tell that story um, and like focus on how Taiwan is its unique. It's its own country through the story of food. And if you dive into Taiwanese cuisine at the very mi micro level, you can see that like the way our soy sauce is made is more similar to Japan, our, same with our vinegar, um, our sugar industry was started by the Japanese, just so many of these little, like just our core condiments are different from the condiments in China. Obviously they're all related, but I would say they're as related as, you know, Korean cuisine and, um, Chinese cuisine. It's just very different. And then um, zooming out a little bit, like going into dishes, a lot of dishes were invented in Taiwan um, and unique to this region. And um, a lot of people think, and it gets confusing because in the 80s, Taiwan was sort of this hub of Chinese food because of all the immigrants who came up here. And some people are still convinced that Taiwan has great Chinese cuisine, but the reality is that our Chinese restaurants here are very bad. Like I've had better Chinese food in LA than I have had in Taiwan. And so it's all of these things that I saw while living here and I just got really frustrated and wanted to like set the record straight. And this book was really just born out of that, just wanting to lay down dish by dish and show people why it's unique to Taiwan, um, you know, how, like how it was created and really just get into the history and the facts of it. Mm. Wow. Um, is there the same type of like regionality in Taiwan that you might see in other places? It's obviously a much smaller country than China or um, many other places in Asia. So what does that look like? Yeah, there is like you can go into certain towns and they'll have like a cracker that you only see there, but it's not known to the average person. It's just like these small little specialties that a town or a little neighborhood is known for um, because it's such a small country. And because now we have been a, a great public transportation system, you don't see these like distinct regional divides, but generally speaking, there is a difference between like Northern Taiwanese food and Southern. So like the South where I'm from, is just a lot of sugar um, and a lot of like pork um, and like lard. And it's just very, very sweet and lots of seafood. And here in Taipei, because there's like a lot of the Chinese 
immigrants have settled up here in North, there's more of that influence um, from China and the food is a little bit more salty. Um, and it, there's also a bit of an international influence up here as well. So you see like the North South divide, but um, like the distinct regional divides aren't as clear anymore. Hmm. Uh, and in terms of recipes, what kinds of like foods and recipes are you really trying to feature in the cookbook? Yeah, so the book is sort of just divided by themes. So we have like beer food, like all the foods you would eat when you're getting, we have a genre of restaurants called Zetal. And so you just sit outside short plastic stools and you just order greasy food and you eat and drink. Um, so I have like a whole section dedicated to that and like night markets and breakfast and the goal is to really just take people through these like different culinary experiences that you have in Taiwan. Um, and again, each theme will like tell a story about the cuisine as well. Like I have a whole chapter just dedicated on like festivals and special occasions because there are dishes that just come out for special occasions. Yeah, yeah. What has the process been like for developing recipes and doing some of the writing? Yeah, it's been very long. I'm almost hopefully done. Um, but I work with a recipe developer. She's a cooking teacher here in Taiwan. She's been teaching for probably as long as I've been alive. Um, and we're funnily enough, like our families are both from the South. And so she gives me like the base recipes and then we build it up from there. And then the research has just been a lot of Googling, calling people, interviewing people. Um, I finished these already, but once a month, um, my team and I would do these like research trips. So we would just go to a town and take some photographs from the book and just interview people. Um, so a lot of on the ground work. I didn't realize it was gonna be this much work and how hard it was, but I can almost see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm really excited for it. Very cool. I don't know if you can share this, but is there a particular recipe that you're really excited about in the cookbook? Yeah, so I have one on stinky tofu from scratch. Um, I don't think I've seen that anywhere in any printed book. I think there are some couple blogger recipes online and it's really just fermented amber. Like stinky tofu is just uh, tofu soaked in pickled brine. And like it's the pickle brine that's stinky, not the tofu. It's like the tofu isn't fermented. So it's again sort of embodies what I like to do in my work, like take something that people are like weirded out by or confused by and just show how simple it really is. Like it doesn't have to be difficult. Wow. Uh, okay, so I think we will go to audience questions here. Um, the first is, was there a member of your family who was the inspiration for you choosing your career? Uh, no, uh, my parents had no input on my career. So no, it was really just watching um, the news as a kid. Mm. How do they feel about your career now? Um, I think they're okay with it. Like typical Asian parents, they don't say much. Um, but yeah, there's not, <laughs> I don't think they care much or yeah, I'm sure they're okay with it. Uh, okay. And, uh, another question here, how has the pandemic changed the Asian food diaspora or landscape? Um, so again, I live in this weird bubble in Taiwan where we have barely been impacted by the pandemic. And in America, I don't know what it's like because I haven't been on the ground there. Um, but I know that a lot of Asian restaurants are hurting um, because of all the Asian violence and a lot of um, there's like this whole campaign um, like hashtag stop AAPI hate where people are asking um, folks to tag their favorite Chinese restaurants and tell a story about them. And I just think we're at a point where there's a lot of xenophobia and like people just seeing a Chinese restaurant and thinking it's dirty. Um, and then as a result, a lot of these mom and pop places that have been around for generations in America are slowly, you know, they just, 
they close and they won't open up again, we're losing such a rich part of the, the culinary fabric. So that's what I know of what's going on in the States. But um, again, like I'm in Taiwan, which has like, I think the most cases we had in a day was like a hundred <laughs> maybe at most. And so our food scene hasn't been impacted at all. Mm. Are you connected with any uh, other Asian American food writers or journalists in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, like casually through Twitter and like online acquaintances, acquaintances and stuff. And I try to chat with a lot of people who specialize in Taiwanese food to just sort of swap notes on how we refer to certain condiments and stuff. Um, but it can be a little bit isolating being out here in Taiwan writing for America where all my other colleagues and counterparts are in the States. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next question here, how does local food fit with this topic of um, Asian cuisine and like specifically looking at um, like China and Taiwan? Yeah, again, like I just really think Taiwanese food and Chinese food really puts an emphasis on seasonality. And if you look at the history of a lot of dishes, it was like we are making a rice dumpling made out of stuff with turnip because it's the turnip season right now. And rice is something that is precious. And so they make these like rice dumplings and then they offer it to their ancestors or to their gods. Um, so I think if you, well, my philosophy with my book and just a lot of my work is if you really look into the history um, of a region's food, you can learn so much about the history of that place or like why things came to be. There's so many stories to be found within a dish if you just dig deep enough. And it's kind of like a, a time capsule, if you will, because it's like these dishes aren't made only during November anymore because of globalization and because we can grab everything whenever we want, where we want, you don't get that anymore. But if you look at the history of these dishes, then you start to picture what it was like before, you know, we were all, we started becoming all connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Taiwan, are there any like really intensely seasonal foods that are important to any foods that you've reported on or that you know or love? Um, I'm sure there are like our fruit industry is really, really big here. Um, and yeah, like you just see, so I go to a vegetable vendor and tell a lot of people just buy their vegetables, just a wet market or a vendor. And it obviously changes and, I, and I've just sort of, sort of gotten used to that. Like I don't think about it anymore. So now that it's cold, there's a lot of root vegetables. And then when summer comes out, you start to see like the summer vegetables, like amaranth and like the leafy greens and stuff. Um, so it is cool. You can see the seasons change when you go to the wet markets. Hmm. Uh, and then our last audience question here. What is your favorite food or who is your favorite person slash people to share a meal with? Um, I really like oyster omelets, which is, so in Taiwan, our oysters are like the size of a coin, like a quarter, and it's this like gooey sweet potato starch pancake with egg, and then they put oysters on it, and they put this like sweet, almost ketchup-like sauce on top, and I think for a lot of people, it's like, oh, that looks so gross, it looks like a, a snail with like oysters in it. But I just find it so delicious. Like I love seafood and like sweeter flavor profiles. And I just think it's because my family is from the South and I'm really used to these dishes. So that I think is my favorite dish. Okay, great. And um, do you have any favorite people uh, that you like to share meals with? Um, Again, I don't think, like, it would be really cool to, like, hang out with the old ladies who, like, shuck the oysters, <laughs> because that's what they actually do. Like, every day they'll, like, harvest it from the bay, and then they'll, like, shuck it from scratch, and then they'll give it to the vendors, and then the vendors will cook it, and it all happens, like, on one street. So it'd be, like, I would love to just, like, spend a day and hang out with them and hear their life stories, 
again, like I'm always just more fascinated with the average person um, story because the average person's story, because I just think there are so many of them that aren't being covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, and then I just have a, another uh, last question here. We hear a lot about nostalgia and authenticity in the world of food generally. And I'm wondering how you um, think about those concepts in your own life, but also in the work that you're doing specifically. Yeah, so I think nostalgia is an easy like frame to get stuck in when you're talking about food. And I really try consciously not to fall for that trap. Like I'm really, like I try not to talk about my family and the foods that I grew up eating because I just think that's such a cliche with Asian food. And I try to just approach it with what's unique about this dish and what is really cool about it or how, something about a technique or the history because I just think it's a bit of a tired trope, to be honest. And on the topic of authenticity, again, like I really hate that word because it just assumes that an arbitrary time or place of where a food came out is the definitive version of that food. Um, I think you can say traditional or like specific to this time era, um, but to deem a dish authentic or not is, I just think a bit ridiculous. And I hope, like that's something I hope that the conversation can move away from. I think a lot of um, keyboard warriors or just trolls online love latching onto that. And it really hurts a lot of chefs too, especially Asian chefs who are cooking a dish and it might not, and I've heard this from chefs that I've interviewed too, they're cooking a dish from their heart that they grew up with, but then people of that same culture accuse them of not being authentic because it doesn't match up to their own ideals. And I just think that is so harmful to this industry. And if you keep on stifling people like that, we'll, we'll never get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, is there anything else that you want to share about your story or your work? No, I think we covered it all. Okay, great. Um, well, I guess we are out of time. So thank you so much for speaking with me about your work and, and yeah, everything that you've done. Um, I really feel like your reporting has shaped how I personally engage with and understand Chinese food and culture, both in the U.S. and China. So I really cool. appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Yeah, and great seeing you again. Yes, you as well. Um, I hope that maybe once things open up again, I'll make it back to Asia. So, For sure, yeah. Um, okay, well, I guess we are all set and I will pass things back off to Ani. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. That was an amazing conversation. So I'm going to hand it to Katie. Um, and so if there's any additional questions um, in the list that I sent you earlier from um, people who submitted them a little bit late, um, and then we can also go through the chat and see if there's any additional questions as well. All right. So let's see. Yeah, are there any questions, Katie, you kind of want to start with as I go through the chat? Yeah, sure. I don't know if we want to just start with the questions in the chat here. Um, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, okay, great. So uh, what drew me to Gold Thread? Um, so I think it cut out in the video uh, at the beginning where I was talking about how Clarissa and I initially met, which was in China in 2018. We just happened to cross paths and at after that, I started following her work a bit more closely because I hadn't really been very engaged with um, media and content regarding Chinese food and culture before that. So I started following her work. And I think at that point, she was working for Gold Thread or starting to work for Gold Thread. And I found the content 
very accessible for and for me especially as someone who's really interested in Chinese food and culture but didn't grow up with that context so I found the content really engaging but also very accessible and I think that's something that I have some interest that I had in Clarissa's story in particular because she grew up obviously speaking Mandarin and um, was able to move through spaces in Asia that are Mandarin speaking, I think, a bit more easily than I was. So I was drawn to her ability to report on that, on that content. And, um, and yeah, and the gold thread content is, like I said in our um, talk earlier, is very wide ranging and covers a lot of different um, regional dishes and um, goes a lot into the history of cuisines in China and particular foods and dishes. So um, very informational and educational, I would say. Um, I can go to so this next question. Um, is from Cassandra. So recently in Pittsburgh, Alei Zhu, the head chef of Chinese restaurant Shengu Gourmet, was nominated for a James Beard Award. Um, and so you guys talked about how there is more representation of Asian cuisine in publications. Um, do you feel like you're seeing this in culinary accolades and like awards as well? Or do you still see this as kind of like an isolated event? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. I personally don't feel very qualified to answer this because I don't follow like culinary accolades very closely and actually had no idea about Weiju um, being nominated. But um, I would say from the little that I do know that this is becoming a more common event. So uh, like we talked about Asian cuisine is being talked about more widely on a lot of different platforms. There are a lot of cookbooks coming out that I think are being recognized. Um, and so it, it's like slowly moving in that direction where it's becoming less and less of an isolated event. And I think that we'll see probably more Asian chefs being recognized in, um, in like big awards like James Beard Awards going forward. And then I did a quick Google search. Um, we're not quite sure. Um, I was on her website for her cookbook and it's slated to be released in 2023. And you can go to her website at clarissaway.com um, and you can sign up for email um, updates to, like, to let you know when the cookbook will be coming out, but the cookbook is named Made in Taiwan. Um, you can also follow her on Instagram at Dear Clarissa. Um, so yeah, let's see, is there any other questions, anyone? All right, awesome. Well, I just really wanna thank Katie and Clarissa. Um, that was really informative and like, I really love the questions and how you frame them. And they just really seem very thoughtful. And I just really appreciate like, just the, yeah, the conversation that you guys had, it was really nice to hear and to be able to think about it and be presented different topics or different discussions in a way that I hadn't thought about before and in also finding ways that we think similarly. So that was also kind of fun. Um, but everyone, I just wanna thank you for your time. Um, like I said before, if you, Chatham, community, friends, you know, if you guys want to be in Katie's seat or you would like to be a, um, a guest for us, um, please click the link that we're going to um, post in the chat to fill out our submission form. Um, you can also email us at craft at chatham.edu if you have any further questions or um, suggestions on what we can do next. Um, at the end of this, a survey is going to pop up. Um, please, please fill that out. It's only a few questions long. It'll help us kind of improve this program and make it a little bit better um, as we keep going along. And you'll also get a reminder email probably the next couple of days as well. You can follow us on Instagram and on Facebook at Chatham, no, at Craft Chatham, sorry. And then next week, we hope you join us again for our final episode. Um, 
It is next Wednesday, March 16th at 3.30 p.m. It's titled Towing the Line, the Black Queer Experience in Colorblind Nonprofit Spaces. Sydney Lawson is our student moderator for this episode, and she talks with Malika Simmons, um, the DC Metro Program Coordinator for Food Corps. And they talk about kind of their shared experience of being um, in a nonprofit food system that is helping the Black community, but also can be colorblind and just the complexities that come along with that. So um, again, this episode airs next Thursday or next Wednesday at 3.30. And we hope that you guys can join us and we really appreciate your time here today. All right, thank you, Katie.